Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and it's the 23rd of August, 2022. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So we have a new blog post here from Eric Wall today that I wanted to kind of put on your radar, and this is basically titled The Case for Social Slashing. So I think this is a really great read. I highly recommend going and giving it a read because it does a great job of summarizing all the intricacies and nuances around social slashing and, and all this kind of stuff that's, that I've been talking about over the last couple of weeks as well. So, I mean, I read through it earlier today and I found myself pretty much agreeing with everything that Eric was saying. He didn't just kind of, uh, I guess, like... Um, go over the pros, but he went over the cons. He kind of still manned the other side uh, of, of this kind of the other argument against it and and, and or everything that surrounds that there. So as I said, like I, I definitely recommend giving this a read. I think the main takeaway from this, the, the thing that stuck out to me most was something that I hadn't thought of before. And that was the fact that when we think about the Ethereum protocol post-merge, so a proof of stake protocol, we think about what tools it has to punish validators for doing the wrong thing. Well, we have slashing, right? We have in protocol slashing for things like surround voting, for double uh, double voting, double, uh, uh, sorry, uh, tr attempting to kind of like double spend, things like that, uh, you know, double signing, all that sorts of stuff. We have things in place to slash people for that in the protocol. And I've explained how it's very hard, if not impossible, I, from my understanding, to be able to kind of like detect censorship in the same way and slash for that. But in, in the context that Eric was bringing up was around slashing, say, Coinbase, for example, a, a very large centralized staking provider, they would all, already get punished if they did something that went against the protocol. Uh, it's just that because we can't uh, objectively view censorship from it, from the protocol, we have to do it in a social way where we have to basically use the same tool that we use uh, for punishing them for like double signing, uh, surround voting, stuff like that. Uh, but we in, to enact those tools, we don't just kind of like do it in an automated fashion within the protocol we have to use the social layer. So it really is the same thing. And the context was that people staking with Coinbase should be prepared to lose some, um, you know, or, or all of their ETH in the event that they get slashed. And, 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 and Eric said basically that it doesn't even matter if it's not a social slash, Coinbase still runs the risk of getting slashed for whatever reason. And so does every staker, mind you. Like, there, it's not a risk-free thing. You still run the risk no matter what. No matter how many kind of like uh, protections you have in place, how many redundancies you have in place, there is always a risk that you're going to get slashed, uh, whether you're, uh, you know, obviously purposely trying to attack the network or not. It's just that we can pu we can punish you for uh, most things in protocol. It's just when it comes to censorship, it needs an extra protocol, I guess, uh, trigger, for, for, for lack of a better term there, in order to get the ball rolling. So from that perspective, uh, any attack on the network should be, you know, whether that be censorship or otherwise, should be, you know, it, it should come with the expectation that you're going to get slashed if you're trying to attack the network. And that's what the social signals around social slashing is all about, is making sure sure that everyone in the ecosystem, I'm not trying to pick on any one provider, but every single validator in the ecosystem, whether that be part of a centralized staking pool or a decentralized one or a centralized service provider or a centralized exchange or a solo validator, it doesn't matter. They all have to abide by the same in protocol and extra protocol rules. And extra protocol is more of a social contract where I think that my stance has kind of evolved on this over the last couple of weeks. I think that if only 20 or 30% of the, the network, say, network validators, for example, are censoring transactions in that they're not including transactions in their block or certain transactions in their blocks, I don't think that's the case for social slashing. But if it becomes the majority of the network that's doing that, well, I think it does become the case for social slashing because it significantly degrades network performance. And it depends on what's being uh, censored and what's not. Obviously, we would like to see zero censorship on the network. But as Pauline pointed out yesterday, miners and validators have always had the ability to include or not include whatever transactions they want in a block. And that's at the protocol level. Like it's an objective thing. It's not something that uh, they're not allowed to do. The protocol gives them the ability to do that. Now, if we want to fix that, we have to basically bring improvements to the protocol, which we are going to do. Where, where it gets really dangerous is when validators refuse to build on top of the longest chain, right? On top of the canonical chain, refuse to attest to blocks on that chain. That leads to forks that leads to competing chains that is when i would be fully in favor of invoking this social slashing of course as a last resort but if it's gone to that point where they, where essentially you have 
a large part of the network saying, well, we're not going to uh, build on these blocks at all. We're not, you know, we're not only not going to include these transactions. We're not going to build on blocks that have these transactions included in them, or build on a chain or a test to blocks that has has these transactions included in them. Well, that's when you lead you get chain splits, and that's when it becomes a direct attack on the network. At least from my perspective, I'm sure many people would agree with me on that. And that's when I think it's very, very justified to socially slash in order to get the network back on track. And that comes with a lot of fallout. It is not pretty. It comes with a lot of uh, uh, this mess, and we don't want to get to that point. So, those are the two main kind of like things, and I, that's my main takeaway from Eric's post here is that we are just enacting the rules of the protocol. We just have to do it in a, in a kind of like subjective way rather than an objective way because we have no way to objectively punish for censorship. It's it, it doesn't it doesn't exist right now. And maybe it won't exist in the future. So we have to make sure that we have a social layer that is willing to use the nuclear option if push comes to shove, as I've described before. But that's my main takeaway. Maybe you have something different. Definitely go give the blog post a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Speaking of the, I guess, like uh, censorship and OFAC sanctions, Ryan Sean Adams today shared a little tweet thread here on how you can help Alex Petsev gain his freedom. Now, the, uh, Alex Petsev here is the Tornado Cash dev that was arrested in uh, the Netherlands, who is still, I believe... Uh, 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 kind of imprisoned on suspicion, but no charges have been filed yet. So if you want to sign a position for his freedom, you can do that. You can join the Telegram group where people are coordinating, and you can also give directly to his defense on Gitcoin. So these are all the things you can do to help him if you're so inclined to do so. Obviously, not being forced to help him if you don't if you don't want to, if you don't feel like getting involved. But these, uh, I, I'm glad to see this kind of like spun up here because. I mean, they originally said that they arrested him because he facilitated or profited from money laundering. And, you know, the fact that as far as I know, they haven't charged him with anything still. And I think it's been over a week at least, uh, probably longer than that now. Um, and, and the fact that they've just kind of like arrested him on, imprisoned him on suspicion is an injustice. And I think it needs to be rectified uh, ASAP. Like I, I, I can't even imagine what I would feel like being in that position where I've got arrested for my connections to this tool that have been sanctioned, but I'm not being charged with anything. And I... I'm just sitting in, you know, potentially a kind of like a holding cell and I've got no idea what's going on. Like I would, uh, that's like a nightmare scenario for me, nightmare fuel for me. Like I, I can't even imagine what it's like for, for Alex here. And I, I read a thread yesterday. I, I don't have it up here right now, but there was a thread. If you go to my Twitter profile, you'll see it on Virgil Griffith and how he's been in solitary confinement for three months because they haven't been able to find beds for him at the prison he's at, which is insane to me. And maybe that isn't the truth. Maybe there's another reason why he's in solitary confinement, but Virgil is not a violent person. I mean, he's in prison for basically spreading knowledge in, in, in kind of like North Korea um, and, and, you know, obviously going against the US because, it's, you know, North Korea is sa sanctioned and I'm not trying to justify or defend his actions here, but he's not a violent, hardened criminal who would have done anything to put himself in, you know, solitary confinement like that. So, like, just when, when you think about it, like, think about how uh, bad that is for a person's mental state just generally and how you would feel in that situation. I would personally feel, like, really, really bad. I'd probably develop some pretty gnarly uh, mental conditions as well because of that. And then, and people do, right? So we need to make sure that uh, uh, we kind of, like, pre preserve, uh, you know, proper justice here and the proper kind of, like, chain of command, the proper process. And this isn't, to me, the proper process here. Like, you can't just arrest someone and not charge them with anything and, and hold them indefinitely. I know that there are certain, I guess, acts or certain... Uh, laws passed in certain countries which allows for this to happen uh, due to suspicion of money laundering, you know, terrorists, financing, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, uh, it, it really just flies in the face of, uh, of, of human rights. And, and, I, and I really think that that's just absolute bullshit. So if you want to support Alex, you can. I'll link these in the YouTube description uh, for you to go to these links. So Matthew Green, who did a uh, podcast with Bankless recently, you should definitely go listen to that. But he's not... I guess, in the crypto ecosystem, so to speak. He is a cryptographer. He teaches cryptography at a uh, university in the US, I believe, uh, or the UK. I think it's one of the two. I, I, I think it's the US. Um, but he's basically said today that he's made a GitHub organization to replug republish a fork of the Tornado Cash repositories that were banned following the Treasury's sanction uh, order the other week. Uh, and then he's also said that 
the, there are a lot of thorny issues around the OFAC Treasury sanctioning of an open source project and what it means for freedom of speech. And to help figure those out, the EFF, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, has agreed to represent Matthew Green on this front, which is very cool. I mean, we have a, an actual cryptographer, a cryptography professor kind of in our, uh, in our uh, court here and going to fight for us, which I think is really, really awesome. And the Tornado Cash uh, repositories are now back live on GitHub here under uh, kind of like Matthew Green. So you can go check those, those out and, you know, download them for your own use if you want to or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, code should not be kind of banned or, 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 or anything like that. And it, it's open source code should be able to be freely looked at and shared and and use at the end of the day. At least that's my uh, that's my uh, my view on things there. But great to see a Matthew Green here taking an actual stand, uh, and, and it seems like he's going to be fighting this in uh, in you know meat space, so to speak. So maybe we can get some actual clarity around this because everyone is still super confused. No one knows what to do. Like it's been. How long now? I think the sanctions happened uh, over two weeks ago now, and there's still not any clarity at all. Like, I wouldn't even say there is any clarity. There's not. Uh, like, and that's really bad, and that really makes it hard for anyone to know where to go from here and what to do from here. Obviously, the wheels of uh, bureaucracy move extremely slowly, uh, and getting anything out of the, the government when it comes to these sorts of stuff is probably going to take a while. But still, we have people in our court, you know, we have people fighting for us and we should support them. So really great to see this from Matthew Green today. All right, last up here, uh, I want to kind of like focus on this uh, graphic that Bantech has made, which is similar to the one that I showed yesterday. But this one basically shows the difference between BTC, ETH1, and ETH2, uh, and uh, the distribution of, uh, I guess, like validators or, or miners. So you can see here on Bitcoin, three pools uh, account for over 50% of the... Uh, um, of the mining uh, on on BTC, so uh, those three pools are color coded here. One of them is uh, Foundry USA, the other one is Ant Pool, and the other one is F2 Pool. Those three alone, from what I can see on the graphic here, account for over 50% of the Bitcoin network. As we all know, you only need 51% of the hash to launch attacks and to start building uh, kind of and, and to become the longest chain on that network. Now, I'm not going to talk about the feasibility of doing that. Obviously, it's not an easy task, but that's the state of it. Ethereum is not much better, if all better. I don't think it's actually better. I think it's in the exact same scenario where you have Ethermine, F2 pool and Hive on pool, I believe here, uh, counting for over 50% of the network. So it's it's basically the same position as, as Bitcoin. And then you have uh, ETH2, or I guess like proof of stake down the bottom, which looks much more distributed. Now, as I've said before, uh, this graphic has split out Lido into its into its singular compartments, because obviously Lido is 29 different validating services. It's not just one monolithic entity. So that makes this look a lot better than it otherwise would have if you counted Lido as one entity. Now, there are debates around how you should count that. I'm not going to get into that uh, now. That now. Uh, but the, the reason why I wanted to bring this graphic up is because just looking at this at face value, you would think that both if the proof-of-work Bitcoin and proof-of-work Ethereum are more centralized than proof-of-stake uh, Ethereum. And I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Because one, there's nuances between proof of work and proof of stake. There's nuances between the, distri the distribution of these stakers and pools. And when looking at proof of stake versus proof of work uh, from like a validator perspective, it gets very murky, especially Ethereum proof of stake versus proof of work. So, and, and then looking at the incentives around that, the game theory around that, and the network itself and the network social layer, there is so much that goes into this. That's why whenever the critics, especially the ones outside of crypto, bring up, oh, you know, uh, proof of work is incredibly centralized because three pools control... 51, uh, over 50% 50 of the of the hash rate, and that's enough to launch an attack. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, if you look, just looking at it from that perspective, it makes sense, but there's also the cost of attack, right? There is, as I said, the game theory behind it, the incentives behind it. There is the community behind it. That it, There is the fact that miners can change pools relatively easily. You just have to basically um, uh, switch your miners over to another pool if you don't want to be part of the pool that, you're, that you were part of. Staking, or it's, uh, Ethereum staking, it's the same thing, but it's a bit more nuanced in the fact that there's a queue to get out. So for example, if you are staking with a service provider and you want to exit, and there's uh, 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 the fastest you can exit, I believe, without a queue at all is within a day. If there is a queue, and depending on how long the queue is, it could stretch out to months potentially. It, it just depends, right? So it's it's very it, it's kind of like different to, to mining. And it's also different in that 
when you're staking with like a Coinbase, for example, you're both giving custody to Coinbase of your ETH and you've given them control over your validator because they're the ones you uh, 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 spinning up the validator. So they could stop you from withdrawing altogether, right? They could stop you from, from spinning down the validator altogether. There are solutions coming to... Uh, kind of rectify that. Uh, there is a lot going on in the proof of stake Ethereum world as well to kind of help with that. But that's the reality of, and the nuances there. So you can't just look at the this graphic and draw conclusions from it just based on the graphic alone, just based on the on the distribution here. You have to look at all the, the nuance behind it. And I actually think, as I've always said, the most important is the social layer. The most important is how strong is the network and how uh, how um, likely is it to uh, repair itself from an attack, both on the technical and the social side. Technical side for proof of work chains, they're pretty much balked. Uh, they, like it's it's pretty hard for them to stop. Uh, I guess like an attacker. They would have to change the hashing algorithm, which I mean, fine, you know, do that. But then you punish all the honest miners. It's very, it's extremely messy, right? Uh, and it basically uh, means that you have to start from scratch with your security for the chain. And yeah, it, it's not a very, very good way of, of dealing with it. On proof of stake Ethereum, we can do this uh, kind of like a, sl a slashing, whether it be social or otherwise, uh, for uh, I guess like attacks on the network and stuff like that. But it's still very, very messy, especially in Ethereum's case because of the DeFi considerations, right? Like, what would the DeFi ecosystem look like in that in that world? Um, and also the collateral damage and the fallout that I've spoken about before. So I just wanted to focus on that graphic for a little bit today because it's definitely a lot more nuanced than just looking at it at face value. And and anyone who kind of like talks to you about these distributions and kind of doesn't talk about the nuance, it, it's worthwhile to correct them on this and worthwhile to explain to them that there's a lot more to this graphic than just the raw numbers. And I think that's true for pretty much everything in crypto and most things in life generally, like taking things at face value and without nuance usually leads to very binary outcomes. It doesn't lead to good debate, doesn't lead to good discussion, doesn't lead to good solutions. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of put that on your radar. I'll link this in the YouTube description. If you're listening to the podcast, you can go check out the graphic for yourself. All right, so uh, Steph here on Twitter posted a slide from Vitalik's ETH Mexico talk on what to build next in Ethereum, or at least what he wants to see built next in Ethereum. So he wants to see wallets using ERC4337 aggregation. Uh, so that's a standard for, for wallet aggregation here. He wants better compression for rollups, which would obviously lead to cheaper fees on rollups. He wants software for nodes in a post dank sharding world. So this would basically mean that he wants people to be able to download as much of the chain history as they want uh, very easily as part of their kind of like node infrastructure. At least that's my interpretation of it. And then he also wants apps that are not possible today, but are possible in a world where transactions are 100 times cheaper. I think he's going to get all of this. I think it's naturally going to, I mean, this is pretty much all being worked on. The first one I know is being worked on. Uh, compression for rollups definitely being worked on by all rollup teams. Uh, the software for nodes in a post dank sharding world I mean, I don't think it's being worked on right now because we don't know exactly what it's what uh, dang, uh, dang Shining is going to look like in its final form on the network. And it's probably going to take a little while before that final form gets uh, gets out there. So I think that there are probably discussions being had and maybe prototypes being built, but nothing concrete yet. But it is still being built, right? And then you have the apps that are not possible today, but are possible when things are cheaper. I think we know some of these apps already, like decentralized social media and stuff like that, but they just haven't been built because it's not 100 times cheaper yet. I mean, at the end of the day, the roll-ups aren't 100 times cheaper than mainnet. They possibly will be after the first version of Proto, -Dank, oh, oh, sorry, after Proto Dank Sharding goes live, but right now they're not they're not there. So I think Vitalik's going to get what he wants here because, uh, as I said, that some of them or most of them are already in development. And the others are just very, very close to being in development. Uh, but great to see him focusing on just what to build. Because I, I think that a lot of focus has been put on the protocol layer, especially by me, because I just focus on the protocol layer a lot um, because of the move to proof of stake, because of these other major upgrades that are coming. But once we have that, you know, massive scalability there, we should really begin more of a focus on the application layer. Because as I've said before, there's no point building all this cool protocol layer stuff if there's no apps to take advantage of it. So we should really put more emphasis on the on the application layer, at least in my opinion. 
All right, so a nice little graphic here from Poly now today. I'm not sure if it's their graphic or if it's come from somewhere else, but I haven't seen this before. But basically, it describes uh, ETH as an asset or really any asset, but I mean, this, this kind of like fits in nicely with ETH. It's this feedback loop where you have at the top, there's a, a circle here with a productive asset in it. And then it goes, uh, and then it continues on and has an arrow pointing to low or no inflation plus high security. And then it goes to uh, that would create a sound store value and that creates rising economic bandwidth, aka a rising asset price, which leads to rising economic activity because more people want to take advantage of that and, 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 uh, and, I guess, uh, participate in more economic activity, which leads to a more productive asset. And then we start this kind of like feedback loop over again. I think this is just a really great way of visualizing why a rising ETH price, for example, is extremely healthy for the entire ecosystem and for the entire uh, kind of like uh, Ethereum network. And it's not just all about number go up to make people rich. At the end of the day, like it's it's all about, you know, security, obviously uh, securing the chain as, as much as we can. And uh, the, the ETH price is directly correlated to that, even more so in proof of stake. But it's also about uh, making sure that we have a more productive asset, which leads to all of this, right? And which leads to more economic bandwidth for us to use. We can use ETH, uh, you know, as I've explained, I think I explained this um, last time when I was talking about stable coins, but a more valuable ETH means we can do more stuff with it within DeFi, at, at, like whether that be as collateral uh, uh, or as kind of like pairing with liquidity pools, we can create a much more robust and healthy DeFi ecosystem. And that would lead to more economic activity because there's more liquidity, there's more robustness, there's more health to the overall ecosystem, which then again makes ETH a more productive asset and then leads to this whole, whole kind of feedback here. So I thought this was just a great way of visualizing that and, and kind of like spelling it out for people because too many people still think that uh, the only reason why we want any of these assets to go up in value is for speculative reasons. Uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot of that there, but for me personally, it's not about that. It's it's about the fact that I recognize that a rising ETH value is extremely positive to the network, both from a security, productivity uh, perspective, and also from a kind of like social perspective of bringing in more people, bringing in more interest, and being able to fund more of the things that we want to see in the ecosystem. There's a reason why we're not struggling for funding this time around like we were after 2017. is because there was a lot more money that came into this ecosystem than back then, especially on the, on the private funding side. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that for you guys. Uh, I'll link this in the YouTube description for you to check out. All right, so it's creeping up. Arbitrum Nitro is going live in nine days. So this is going live obviously on August 31st. And I'm assuming that Arbitrum Odyssey will be activated within a few days of that. So very exciting times coming up for Arbitrum here. Uh, I didn't realize how close it was actually. I didn't even realize it was the 23rd of August today, which is just crazy. I was like, what the hell? Winter's almost over. Obviously, I'm in Australia. So uh, it's almost spring. The fir first day of, uh, of spring's coming up. I was like, wow, that has gone by so quickly. I don't even know where 20 2022 has gone. And also then I realized, wow, the merge is so close, right? <laughs> so we have some super exciting stuff happening here. We have Nitro happening on, on the 31st. Then we have the merge mid-September. And we have, I'm sure, a lot more things around that uh, are kind of like coming out as well. Uh, it's just a super exciting time to be in Ethereum, that's for sure. But yeah, I just wanted to give a heads up to you guys that Nitro is very close. And what Nitro is going to basically bring is those much cheaper transactions because the, um, the limit how that you know, that, that um, Arbitrum Nitro has imposed on itself is going to be raised a lot. And then Odyssey will be turned back on so you'll be able to be uh, kind of like uh, partake in that. So just wanted to, to remind you guys about that one. All right, so Maker uh, Dow announced today the, a defining moment they're calling it to envision the potential of connecting decentralized finance and real world finance. Huntingdon Valley Bank and Maker pioneered the first commercial loan participation between a U.S. regulated financial institution and a decentralized digital currency. Maker is connecting to the legacy economy through the largest real world asset vault to date and its first relationship with the U.S. bank. Mike, Maker has come under scrutiny slash, I guess, like attack for their maybe difference in philosophy that they've had since going to multi-collateral die where they think that these centralized real world assets are a benefit to the maker protocol, not a liability. I don't know where I sit on this. I am still a very big fan of, uh, of kind of just ETH uh, only, uh, an ETH only backed stablecoin. But I've described before why that's very hard to achieve at scale and especially with stability. And I've explained why I believe that multi collateral DAI is not a bad thing and why it is potentially necessary for DAI to be able to scale up. But it does compromise on those decentralization ideals, right? It doesn't, like, DAI is definitely not a fully decentralized stablecoin these days. And I do wonder 
if onboarding these real world assets just keeps watering that down. Because if this is being done with a regulated US financial institution, you know, if there is, a, I, mean, I know it's not like a large part of the collateral backing die right now, but what if it does become that? And then, uh, you know, the thing is we already have the USDC risk. So we, we're just adding more risk here. And the mega folks are very good at gauging risk and very good at kind of like uh, measuring this sorts of stuff. But I don't know. I feel like it's just introducing unnecessary complex, maybe not complexity, but like more unnecessary risk into the protocol of something that I would love to see go back more towards being, you know, a more decentralized stablecoin. But I think that that's just not the way that Maker is going to be from from now. And that's not to say that Maker can't be a successful protocol, can't be a good protocol, can't be something that we can get a lot of value out of. But I think the days of calling Maker a decentralized protocol and die decentralized stablecoin uh, are over at this point. Um, maybe you can say semi decentralized, and there's just like that added risk of those centralized assets potentially being frozen, and things like that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, this is what a lot of people are wrestling with right now when it comes to Maker. Maker's been around for ages. I've been a huge fan of them. I've used Maker plenty of times. I've used Dai plenty of times. But uh, I don't want to kind of like fool myself into kind of like thinking that it is a fully decentralized thing anymore. In saying all of that, I still think what they're doing is very cool here. I, I think inevitably we're going to need to bridge the gap between DeFi and kind of like traditional finance anyway. I know that traditional finance is locked down really, really hard with regulations and all that sorts of stuff, but it's way bigger than us. There's no way in hell that we're going to be able to scale DeFi to the world without plugging into traditional finance and basically offering them all these good, uh, better tools on their level, on their playing field. They're not going to change their, their rules for us anytime soon. The regulations are not going to change for us anytime soon. So if we want to play in their world, we have to play by their rules. Just like if they want to play in our world, they have to play by our rules uh, uh, to an extent. I mean, they could create like a super regulated uh, on-chain thing that maybe they just use, but like no one in, in, in you know, DeFi is going to want to use that. They're going to use the alternatives. Still, like it's all about compromise when, uh, when it comes to this sort of stuff. Yes, I want to see fully decentralized protocols take over the world, especially when it comes to DeFi, but uh, I'm also pragmatic about onboarding people. Like there's no point creating fully decentralized things if no one's using it. Like who cares then? We want to, you know, be pragmatic, get as many users as possible, bridge the gap between DeFi and TradFi, but also preserve what makes DeFi so great. Obviously decentralization, um, you know, no KYC, no AML, freedom, privacy, all the good stuff that we, we know and love when it comes to DeFi. We want to preserve that as we scale up to the world. And it's a delicate balance. It's not an easy thing to do. And I don't think attacking any protocol, attacking any person uh, is the way to go. I think, you know, just working to make the technology better is probably the way to go there. All right, reminder that Gitcoin grants around 15 is only 16 days away. So there is a kind of uh, $2.6 million in matching funds that have been committed so far between the main round, four cause rounds, and 13 ecosystem rounds. So you can increase your grant potential by submitting early here on the link. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to remind you guys that this is happening in between September 7th and September 22nd. So basically in the heart of the merge season, I guess we can call it merge season. That's a that's a that's that's got a like nice ring to it there. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, and it's happening uh, uh, on, on Gitcoin, obviously. You can go check this out. We'll link it in the description below. All right, so Swell Network today has announced their Guarded launched. Swell Network is now live on the Ethereum mainnet via a Guarded launch. This is the next critical milestone in the pathway to bringing next generation liquid staking to the ecosystem. So this is another liquid staking uh, protocol that has entered the fray here. Obviously, we have a lot of these already. Or well, not that. No, actually, we don't have that many of these. I think the most popular ones are obviously Rockapool and Lido, but Swell Network has entered the fray here and uh, you know they, they've got a guarded launch, which basically means that there's limits to, to how much kind of uh, ETH can be staked with them and what could be done with them. So you can see the guarded launch stages here where there's a different ETH threshold between the different stages. So there's five different stages. The fifth one will be an open ETH threshold, so everything uncapped. But until then, it's actually a pretty small cap. So in the first stage, it's only a 320 ETH cap. And then you can see it goes up uh, by 10X to 3,200, double to 6,400, uh, and then just, uh, and then um, uh, I think it's a 50% increase to 9,600 here uh, in, in terms of like an ETH threshold. And then stage five is just gonna be open to all. So you can read the details in this blog post for the full uh, kind of um, overview here. But great to see another liquid staking protocol go live on the Ethereum mainnet. All right, so uh, just a quick shout out here is that uh, Tuberfiz put out this 
this tweet today saying, for the next three weeks, I'll be focusing on supporting the best merge viewing call that we can offer. Each staker is teaming up with Bankless and myself, uh, myself being me, Anthony, uh, to bring the community closer together as we celebrate the fruition of years of work. The merge is coming. We are going to make it. So uh, the merge is coming in, as it says here, three weeks. Uh, it's going to be an amazing time for all of us, and we're going to celebrate it on a call just like we've celebrated the test net. Uh, uh, the testnet mergers. It's going to be a much bigger call. We have like a whole agenda planned. We're super excited about it. We're in the planning stages right now. We want to make it extremely memorable. Like I think if anything needs to be memorable in terms of calls within the Ethereum ecosystem, this is the one. We only do the merge once. I mean, hopefully, hopefully nothing goes wrong. We don't have to do it again. But you know, we're, we're, we're assuming that we're only doing the merge once. It only happens once in Ethereum's history. There will never be a move to proof of stake again because we'll already be on proof of stake. Uh, so we want to get this right right we want to make it as fun as possible and i couldn't you know i don't think it could be in better hands than folks like east staker and bankless i mean i'm there too but i'm just along for the ride like i'm just super excited i think i just bring the energy uh and apparently i'm bringing a dance too but we'll see about that <laughs> just but yeah i mean my my point in bringing this up is i just wanted to make you guys aware that we're we're uh like super excited about this call um and obviously the details will be out as we get closer to uh to the to the merge date uh but i hope to see you all there on, on that one uh and speaking of calls uh i did my final twitter spaces with with ssv network today where i had that merge series that i've been doing for the last two and a half months this twitter spaces was a back-to-back -back episode with alon from ssv network we talked all things ethereum decentralization censorship resistance all the good stuff there and then the second half of the episode was I was joined by uh, two people from Lido and two people from Rocket Pool to talk about everything Ethereum staking. So you can go check out that final episode and SSV Network will also be uh, posting on their channels uh, all the episodes and everything and all the education materials around that. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, but I thank them for having me on and letting me host, letting me interview some interesting people uh, and asking them interesting questions. Uh, but yeah, I think on that note, that's going to be a wrap for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.